so easy for this just to seem like head knowledge. I, I probably think of this as head knowledge most of the time, but actually it's the complete opposite of what head knowledge is. The Spirit of God living in you with the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. In other words, he's got history. He's got, um, he's got a, a, a past um, track record. He's raised Jesus from the dead, and now he lives in me, and he lives in you. It should start to transform us. He, the Holy Spirit, should transform us from the inside out. There should be a changing uh, of us. There should be a shaping of us. Our soul should be very changed from the fact that we have the Holy Spirit living in us. Now, Paul's writing to these Jewish Christians, and we've got to think, well, what would... um, spiritual life be like for, for, Jew, for the Jews. Historically, they would have gone to the temple in Jerusalem. They'd have gone on pilgrimage there if they weren't in or near Jerusalem on their own. They'd have gone to synagogues for, to, um, regularly to hear the word of God. Rabbis would have unpacked the word of God to them. They'd have had religious festivals. And these things, along with sacrifices and other spiritual acts that they would have done, would have been what they would have um, been used to leading them close to and, and into, into what God was leading them into. But Paul is saying, that's not the case anymore. You don't have to go anywhere. The Spirit of God lives in you. The Spirit of God dwells in us. And uh, just as we were singing that song earlier, weren't we? The Spirit, where the Spirit of God is, there is freedom. And I think probably, um, maybe every, until this morning, I probably have always sung that song, and I've thought, oh yeah, the Spirit of God in the church, in the church there's freedom, there's freedom in the church, and that's true. But the Spirit of God's in me. When, where I go, the Spirit of God brings freedom as well. He brings freedom in me, and he can bring th- freedom through me, as well as when we're gathered in the corporate sort of environment like this. These Jews would have had specific sort of um, religious highs and and things that they would have had to live towards. And in our culture, we have the same. In our culture, there's things like holidays, experience days, celebrations, celebrities. This is what's put out on social media. This is what's pushed down our throats from our culture. This is what's celebrated, and none of it's wrong. People will even come come to church and stick their holiday photos from Disney on the screen. None of it's wrong. But we celebrate these life highs, don't we? And what we must be careful to do is not to make the same in our spiritual lives. There's some, there's some great spiritual highs that happen. We can go to Christian conferences. We can meet with God closely there. But we can also meet with God closely at home, in our bedroom, when we're on our knees, and when we're praying. We can have great spiritual highs when we're, when we're at church. We can, have, uh, we can reflect on our relationship with God and say, oh, God spoke to me here 10 years ago, and, and God healed me of this then. But that's, that's brilliant. That's God moving. But that doesn't define what our relationship with God is like now. Dallas Willard, an American writer, who says, says this, we have somehow encouraged the separating of our faith from everyday life. We've relegated God's life in us to special times, places, and states of mind. Take Christ into the workplace, we say. Bring Christ into the home. But doesn't this all point to the deadly assumption that Christians normally leave Christ at the church? I do that. I know I do that. But if God lives in me, if the Spirit of God lives and dwells in me, then the truth is, is that my daily life should be shaped by him. I know that when I, when I go into my work in the NHS, employed in the NHS, I can see the kingdom of God advance just as much as I can in my employment at KCC. It's different, it looks different, but the kingdom of God can be advanced. I can walk into God's presence just as much as I can at home as I can when I come into church and worship. When I'm in the car, I can hear from God just as clearly as I can when I'm at a Christian conference. The Spirit of God lives in us. 
I became a Christian at around the age of 12, and, and the Bible was quite clear. It says that before then, I was dead spiritually. I was dead. I may have looked like a Christian, I may have behaved like a Christian, I may have taught like a Christian, I would have gone to church regularly with my family, but spiritually I was dead. And then ever since then, every single day, the Spirit of God has lived in me, and it definitely hasn't looked like it every single day. It hasn't felt like it every single day, but the truth is, is that the Spirit of God is living in me. Every day, making me more and more like Jesus, transforming me, working on me. It's um, similar to the difference between going on holiday somewhere and living somewhere. If you go on holiday to Spain, it's it's lovely. You go on holiday, it's hot, you go by the beach, maybe you go for a swim, um, you eat nice food, and at the end of it, you have some, you're refreshed for a little while, Then then you have some good photos and you have some fantastic memories, don't you? But if you live in Spain, then you start to eat the Mediterranean diet, which is meant to be good for your health. Maybe you start to take siestas in the, in the afternoon, a nap in the afternoon, and your pace of life slows down, and you're maybe a little bit less stressed than, than you were before. Maybe you start to speak the language, and you start to think differently, you start to communicate differently. By living there, by living in Spain, my life would be gradually changed. I would be gradually changed. And that's the same. That's meant to be the same when we live in God. What does your life look like? Not not how well did you worship this morning. Not, um, Not did you hear God this morning, but how is it looking like this week? What is it looking like at work? or in social, social settings in your family? Do you sense God living in you? Or do, do you more associate with what Paul describes in verse 5, thinking about sinful things, things not from God? In verse 9 he says, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit of God. If you have the Spirit of God living in you, you're controlled by the Spirit of God. So often I can can think, and I don't know if you fall into the same trap as me, that the devil has more power. Just recently I'm doing a a Freedom in Christ course with a guy who's just become a Christian. And uh, in it, one of their phrases says something along the lines of, um, the devil has as much authority as we allow him to have. Where am I allowing the devil to have more authority and power in my life? Sometimes I think, oh, that habit of sin, I can't overcome it. It's a habit. It's been there for years. But that's not the truth. It says in 1 John 4, 4, the spirit who lives in you is greater than he who lives in the world. The spirit who lives in us. The spirit of God dwelling and living in us. That's point one. Point two, the spirit who leads us. In Romans 8.14, it says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. All who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. I think we can flip it as well. All who are children of God are led by the Spirit of God. We'll have all seen those mountaineers going up um, Everest. And when you go up Everest, you don't try and go up Everest on your own. Do you? You don't. You just don't. That would be crazy. You go up with a Sherpa, and a Sherpa is a um, Tibetan person who's grown up on the, the mountain sides of the Himalayas, and they, they, over years and years, they become familiar with the, the mountains, the way they work, they get used to the weather systems. They learn um, what, like they can almost sense like what's coming up. It, it, like today, it feels like it's really humid, and you're, you're not surprised if there's going to be some thunder later on, especially if you've looked at the BBC weather app. But... The, but the Sherpas, they, sort of, they get used to the weather and the mountains, and they don't just go up Everest once in their lifetime. They go up tens of times. Every year, they're taking up a different person. And it takes weeks for the Sherpa and the mountaineer to prepare. They, they build a relationship together. The Sherpa's job is to, to encourage, to challenge, to, to warn, to, to make sure that this mountaineer will get up and back down the mountainside safely. And the mountaineer's job is to listen to the Sherpa. When, when the wind starts blowing around Everest and when the, the snow starts falling down, 
the mountaineer has to tune their ear to the Sherpa, to listen to what the Sherpa is saying, to, to the encouragements, to the guidance, the warnings. And it's the same with us. How are we doing listening to the leading and the prompting of the Holy Spirit? I want to um, take us to just one of my favorite um, stories in the whole of the Bible in Exodus 33. And it's Moses, and he's talking to God. And basically, the people of Israel have come out of Egypt, out of slavery in Egypt. They've been led into the desert by a, uh, by a pillar of, of cloud and fire. They've been led into the desert. And now Moses is talking with God, and he's saying, God, who are you going to send with me? Who are you going to send with me? And God replies this in verse 14. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other peoples on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you and I know your name. Can you imagine if we had that same attitude as Moses? Lord God, this morning, we are not going to leave here unless your presence goes with us. Lord God, tomorrow when I leave the house, I am not going to leave unless your presence goes with me. It's different to obedience. You see, they had been, on the whole, there's a few, there's a few instances where they haven't, but they had been following God already. They had been following the, the pillar of cloud and the fire. They had been walking into the, into the desert following God. But the presence of God is different. The presence of God is tangible. It's personal. It affects your life. It changes you. It distinguishes you, is the words that Moses used. It transforms us. We should be expecting this this Spirit of God dwelling in us, leading us to transform us. In Romans 8 verse 5 it says, those who are controlled by the Spirit think think about things that please the Spirit. And then in verse 6, that Sam read out earlier, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Life and peace. And that verse in Exodus 14 I just read out, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. There's those famous verses in Psalm 23 where where God is is the picture of the shepherd and he's leading us, uh, the sheep, by still calm waters. When the Spirit of God leads us, he leads us into peace, into rest. It doesn't mean that life's going to be easy. It doesn't mean it's not going to be hard and there's no challenges. But if you're making a decision, we can, we can look to God and his leading for where he leads us in peace. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe, you, maybe you're making a decision. I know Kez and I are making decisions about some things at the minute. We have to trust that God will lead us by giving us a peace, not the answers, a peace. I'm speaking to myself as much as, as much as anyone else here. How are we doing? Being led and defined by the Holy Spirit. How are we doing this morning? We can develop this by pressing into a relationship with God. The same as I would build a relationship with a friend or with my wife quality time, communication. When when I'm doing it well, the relationship goes well. When When I don't do it so well, the relationship slowly starts to have a downward spiral. How are we doing spending time with God? One thing that that I've just been trying to do recently over the last sort of nine months or so, and it's not consistent and I've not done great at it, to be honest, but I just try and tell God what I'm doing. God already knows what I'm doing. Of course he knows what I'm doing. But if I'm walking home from work, I just tell him, God, I'm walking home from work. And, and sometimes that's all I can tell him. And sometimes I can tell him more than that. But what I'm doing, I mean, it's not helping God. He already knows. But what it is doing is helping me. I'm focusing myself 
onto him. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing my mind, to, I'm bringing God into my mind and putting him to the front of my attention and just telling him what I'm, what's going on. I'm struggling with this. I've got a room full of people looking at me and, and well, I've got to say something next. God, help me. <laughs> or, or, oh, there's this problem in, at home. God, help me. We need to make sure that we are, we are intentionally speaking to him, building patterns into our lives, the habit of spending time with God. So God lives in the spirit who lives in us, the spirit who leads us, and the spirit, the third point is the spirit of adoption. In verses 15 to 17, it says this, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. We're not fearful slaves. We're not fearful slaves. Paul would have been thinking about the Roman sort of context. And in Romans, as we, all, as we all know, there would have been many, many slaves. A life that would have been full of fear, full of dread, full of unknown. Life completely helpless. Not in control of anything because your master is control of it. Physically punished, beaten. Some of them spending their whole lives in chains having to do manual labor, just regardless of the situation that's around them. One historian in the first century BC describes the slave's life like this. For no respite or pause is granted them in their labors, but compelled beneath blows of the overseers to endure the severity of their plight, they throw away their lives in this wretched manner. Indeed, death in their eyes is more to be desired than life because of the magnitude of the hardships they must bear. A horrendous life. Not life as God planned it. And this is what Paul is saying. No longer are you slaves to sin. You are no longer fearful slaves bound to an enemy. Instead, you're children of God. You've been adopted as his own children. And now rather than, than uh, referring to a master, you can refer to Abba, Father. Brought into a royal family, a different family, a new master. Heirs. Heirs of God. Not, not because we've earned it, not because we deserve it, not because of that's what we're worth, but an inheritance, the whole inheritance, because we're a part of the family. In Paul's culture, adopted children would have been, would have, would have been forgiven of any debts or crimes or anything that, um, that had gone in their, in their previous family. It would have been completely forgiven, completely wiped clean. They would have, um, they would have had a completely new identity, a new name, it's completely gone. And that's the same with us. No longer slaves to sin, but now free. Our past not dictating our future. What, how? Why? Because when Jesus gave his life on the cross, he paid the ransom, he paid the price. He paid the penalty for you and for me for that sin. I've got a friend in, in America who literally a week ago um, adopted a, a child. And um, he was telling me about a month ago, it, it, cost, it could have cost them about $80,000 to adopt this child, a huge amount of money. But Jesus has paid the price for our adoption he has paid this massive price. He's paid way more than $80,000. He's paid with his whole life. And he's brought freedom. No longer slaves to guilt, to shame, to sin, to death. 
Romans 8, 1, we heard it earlier, for now there is no condemnation for those who live in Christ Jesus. Completely free. Those chains are gone. That was you. That was your old family. That was your old life. But now, as a Christian, you are made new. Forgiven. I don't know how that speaks to you today, how that connects with you today. How are you living your life? Are we living knowing the truth that God lives in us? That it should affect our every day. That the Spirit leads us and guides us and encourages us to places of peace, to places of rest. And that there's a spirit of adoption that through Jesus, absolutely everything, every chain, every piece of bondage, has been broken. We don't have to live in, the, in that anymore. We can live in the good of Jesus. Sam, do you want to just uh, come up? If we could just stand up. Lord, I... We come to you and we thank you. We praise you, God, that you have saved us from, from slavery. That you've adopted us into your royal family. That you've changed our very identity. No longer slaves, but princes and princesses. Thank you, God, that you don't leave us to be on our own. Thank you that you dwell in us, that you lead us, that you encourage us, that you have done this morning and you will do tomorrow morning. We pray, give us ears to hear. Amen.